I have a fairly mellow Discord if you want to join us there for a bit of conversation and debate. We have people from all over, really, and for the most part, it's fairly good natured and peaceful. As long as you come in that kind of spirit, you'll be fine. Hello, ladles and jelly spoons. Okay, so. Wizards of the Coast have put out some more information about the new OGL. There isn't really an OGL by the sound of it. Uh, SRDs, 1D and D, and so on. Aiming, I think, to try and put out the the fires of the panic that has been particularly going through the the noob community. Um, I want to give you my sort of cold initial read on what they say. So while I have retweeted and shared some comment threads and articles and things, that was as much to bookmark it for myself as anything else, and I haven't really seen much. So this is my opinion as a near 25-year veteran RPG designer who's worked on a great deal of OGL stuff, both... uh, D20, D&D based and and otherwise. So the first point on their list is answering the question, will one D&D include an SRD and be covered by the OGL? So they say yes. First, we're designing one D&D with 5th edition backwards compatibility, so all existing created content that is compatible with 5th edition will also be con- compatible with one D&D. Important to note. Second, we will update the SRD for 1D&D as we complete its development. Development that is informed by the results of playtests that we're conducting with hundreds of thousands of D&D players now, provided you're on D&D Beyond, of course, which cuts out a bunch of people. So, um, so the SRD for 5th edition is not particularly complete, uh, which has forced people to create all manner of alternatives to ideas, concepts, races, rewordings, basically, um, on online wikis and so on. So if they keep the SRD better updated and more complete, that could be a good thing. They say it'll be covered by an OGL, but this new OGL, as we'll see, doesn't really seem to be an open gaming license in the way that we have come to think of it. So I would hope that this time around they keep the SRD much better updated. Uh, The second point they make is, will the OGL terms change? And this is the real meat of it. They say, yes, we will release version 1.1 of the OGL in early 2023. They say the OGL needs an update to ensure it keeps doing what it was intended to do to allow the D&D community's independent creators to build and play and grow the game we all love without allowing things like third parties to mint D&D NFTs and large businesses to exploit our intellectual property. So clearly they're running scared of uh, a second Pathfinder while at the same time creating the circumstances that will inevitably lead to a second Pathfinder. Well, not inevitably, but close to inevitably. Um, And they don't like that so many people have been making so much money on Kickstarters and other crowdfunded projects and things that they didn't intend the OGL to be used for originally. And so they want a piece of that pie, as we shall see. So in OGL 1.1, they're going to be clearer about what it covers and what it doesn't. Um, It will only be material created for use in or as tabletop role-playing games. And those materials are only ever going to be permitted as printed media or static electronic files. So PDFs, EPUBs, and printed books. So that's going to present a problem for D&D wiki pages, which have been massively useful as a resource, as a a dungeon master, I I will say, and as a games master for other open games. Um, So that's going to severely limit the utility of the internet. for running games for one D&D, which I think is a huge, a huge ball lake, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, if it's outside of printed media and static electronic files, the OGL doesn't cover it. Okay, so that's a big change. Uh, will this affect D&D content and services players use today? They say it shouldn't because a lot of independent platforms and so on already have custom agreements with wizards to do what they do. They mean virtual tabletops, merchandising and so on. 
Uh, so it's just it's uh, the tighter wording and more explicit about what is and isn't allowed or supposedly will be. We haven't seen the actual document yet, so don't don't quite panic yet. Uh, second, we're updating the OGL to offer different terms to creators who choose to make free share alike content and creators who want to sell their products. So there will be a differentiation between people who give it away, whether you'll then be able to say send donations, whether that will apply to something like Patreon, where you're giving stuff away but people subscribe to you as a creator. Not yet clear. Um, and there hasn't really been a differentiation in the past between whether you were just making stuff to, to give away for free, which you've kind of always really had the right to do, or whether you were doing commercial content wherein the OGL made sense to use as sort of sort of protection. Um, so it looks like if you're giving away for free, things will remain largely the same, though the other restrictions still seem to apply. Whereas if you're making commercial content, it seems like they want to change things up quite a lot um, so you'll have to accept the license terms whether you'll have to send something in to uh, to wizards as you did under the fourth edition uh, GSL license I don't know uh, and inform them what you're putting up for sale um, this is a huge ball ache and all kinds of paperwork to be bothered with especially considering it's going to make no difference whatsoever it's just a technicality that you'll have to do it uh, you have to report OGL-related revenue annually if you make more than $50,000 in a year. Now, OGL-related revenue? People might publish content that has nothing to do with D&D under OGL 1.1. And so do they have to report that? Um, again, it's a lot of legal technicalities and potential problems. And again, a, a massive ball ache. But most people aren't going to be making more than $50,000 in a year from OGL content. Um, and the other value that they mention in all of this is $750,000, which they reckon only about 20 creators or secondary companies do. But they want to take your money if you make that more than $750,000. So that's clearly not an open license in the spirit of the original OGL which was based on things like Linux, Unix, and so on, uh, and, and Creative Commons to, to an extent. Um, they say they're going to provide explanatory videos, FAQs, and so on, but keep in mind this will be Wizards' interpretation of what they're trying to do, and I think they're already being a bit duplicitous in what they're saying here. So, let's revisit all of this. How is this going to affect you? If you want to toe the line and be in with wizards uh, and so on, then it's going to mean paperwork, accounting, uh, a creator product badge on your work and so on. It looks like they're trying to find a sort of uh, compromise position between the fourth edition GSL and the OGL as was in a way that will please absolutely no one. Now keep in mind you have never really needed to use the OGL it has always been allowed to produce material that is compatible with any game system really and to publish it and to even publish it for profit what you're not allowed to do is use people's intellectual property independent gaming magazines back when we still you know printed gaming material on dead trees all took advantage of this loophole I guess uh, to provide support and information for all sorts of games that was unofficial uh, but compatible and that you could use in your games so old magazines like uh, Games Master International, Arcane things like that, they had adventures for all sorts of game systems with and without licenses of, of various degrees and all you had to do was acknowledge the copyright, the intellectual property, avoid using anything that was you know fully the property of the company and you could put out whatever you wanted i mean there were articles in some of these magazines about playing intellectual property like the terminator in cyberpunk things like that all perfectly legal fine above board right there's no there's no issue with that you can't copyright game systems basically and it's fine to publish compatible material as long as you acknowledge and avoid 
yeah, the, the really intensely protected IP. Now, the other really interesting thing is if you look at section nine of the original OGL, the first version. Okay, so section nine, which may well be missing from the new one, but says updating the license. Wizards or its designated agents may publish updated versions of this license. You may use any authorized version of this license to copy, modify and distribute any open game content originally distributed under any version of this license. So if you don't want to use OGL 1.1, you can still release things under OGL 1.0a. The wording of that suggests to me that even if they update the OGL, you can still use the 1.0 license to release content that's covered by the 1.1 license. So that will be interesting to see <laughs> to see how that all shakes out. But meanwhile, there's absolutely nothing to stop you continuing to use the older OGL to release open content. And if everything is fully compatible with fifth edition uh, in the way that they say that it is, you should basically be able to carry on as you are using the older license. It really depends how integral any mechanical changes and so on they put into one D&D are. And the wording seems to suggest that you could still use that anyway because it's any version of the license. Um, basically, section nine seems to have safeguarded uh, any, any future changes to the license, so that making it essentially irrevocable. Uh, though some people disagree. That's, that's really where we stand here. They haven't particularly answered any questions that well. They've raised a whole bunch of new questions and they seem to have been del deliberately vague. Given the terms that they're expressing, this new OGL won't be an OGL in anything but name, but given section nine in the old OGL um, and the sheer nature of the material and the breadth of stuff that has been released, and their claims of compatibility, I, I don't see this really causing a problem. What it does do is it indicates the kind of mindset that has taken hold over at Wizards, and that's m much more concerning, I would say. Um, yeah, and that's, that's about where we are on that. Um, I will now go and properly review all the threads and videos and things, see what other people are commenting on, and I may or may not put out an additional video, but I think there's value in getting people's raw perspectives from different points of view, and this is mine as a, as a designer, as a creator, as an industry veteran. Um, and I mean, well, there's, there's one other thing I want to say quickly. And that is this, um, in an old FAQ, which you can still access via Wikipedia and the Wayback Machine, um, they were asked, can wizards change the license in a way that I wouldn't like? And their own answer verbatim was answer, yes, it could. However, the license already defines what will happen to content that has been previously distributed using an earlier version in section nine. As a result, even if Wizards made a change you disagreed with, you could continue to use an earlier acceptable version at your option. In other words, there's no reason for Wizards to ever make a change that the community of people using the open gaming license would object to because the community could just ignore the change anyway. So straight from the horse's mouth, if you will. Um, am I likely to develop for open D and D? Yeah, we'll see how things shake out, but probably not, <laughs> given this state of affairs, or at least uh, very minimally. Take care, Zhang. Old Fat Punks is part caper, part comedy, part nostalgia, and part commentary. It follows three aging punks as they build themselves up for one big, nihilistic last hurrah. You can buy Old Fat Punks at Amazon, DriveThruFiction or Lulu.com. Follow the links below or search on those sites.